thanks all the doctors. Um, thanks for your lectures. My father is 94 years old, uh, two and a half years before he found, um, occasionally found uh, a small uh, renal mass in the left kidney at 1.2 cm. Now it grows to the 2.5 cm. Uh, still in the so-called active um, surveillance. And during this time, he had a stroke, uh, recovered pre pretty good for the stroke, but after that, uh, he used some drugs to prevent the stroke and also majorly concerned the stroke again, so he used the Plyvex. Um, according to the um, insert, the one of the um, side effects that Plyvex, uh, it will cause the white cell can't reduce, is that may uh, potentially cause immuno problem for the kidney cancer, this is the first one. Secondly, um, one of the option it says it can do the partial um, uh, the uh, nef nephronectomy, but uh, uh, some doctor said because his age and also even without aspirin uh, practice, it may cause difficult to recover. So the partial um, cut may be more difficult to recover than the total cut. Is that true or not? Thank you. Yeah, I think Dr. Ramfors, I will let you answer the question. I guess maybe I'll rephrase, and you can tell me if, if this is correct. Uh, you know, one, one question is how does Plavix affect um, decisions about going to surgery, and then um, also how do you decide when you're going to go to surgery or not when there's these other factors. Yeah. yeah. And the, the Plavix uh, cause uh, the white cell count low oh. will affect the immune response to the existing cancer or not? Okay, we'll, we'll let Dr. Moskos take that one afterwards. Uh, oh. I would predict, I, I do not, I'm not very confident about the Plavix side effects and what types of white blood cells are being affected. Uh, if that affects the neutrophils, which probably would be the case, then these again are innate immunity cells that are not significantly playing a role in the overall cancer and recognition and everything. So if Plavix does affect non-lymphocytes, I would say that they would not affect response to immunotherapies. Yeah, and I, I would, I would I would think that we would, in that case, that in the patients with cardiovascular disease, we would see disproportionate percentage of patients with immune-modulated secondary malignancies. Um, so what was, can we go back to what, the, what those questions were? Um, one was the, how old is the patient? I'm sorry? It's a 94 years old. Um, two years before was no much complaint. Still no complaint about the mass in the, uh, Kidney, no urine, yeah. uh, blood, no nothing, but it had a stroke between uh -huh. um, the two years. Yeah. So uh, what you're describing is you're talking about a tumor that's incidentally diagnosed, right? That isn't doing anything to them. Not yet. Not yet. good, good, good verbiage. Not yet, but um, in a patient that has a significant comorbidities, including age. Not, not the least of which. Um, you really have to put things all together again, like I said before, and you, you determine what's more likely to hurt the patient. Is the treatment of the tumor more likely to hurt the patient, or is the tumor more likely to hurt the patient? In a situation like this, again, without having met your relative or, um, and knowing them and their functional status and their other medical history and not knowing whether or not their parents live to be 120 years old, or, you know, without knowing that, there are very few people that are going to encourage an in intervention at this time, um, considering that the likelihood of hurting that patient with an intervention is higher than the tumor hurting them. Thanks, Rob. And, and by the way, even with by size criteria, and, and though that's growing, let's say you're talking about a four centimeter sporadic tumor that is kidney cancer, let's just make so, those assumptions. The likelihood of, I mean, what you're worried about is you're worried about that spreading, right? So first of all, it's gonna, 
it's growing reasonably slowly, and then the likelihood of that, likelihood of that spreading is somewhere between one and three percent per year. So even that is still low, right? So. Do we have another question? I, I just wanted to ask um, Dr. Harrison a question, and, and maybe the answer is nobody's looked, but um, uh, now that all the immunotherapies are coming around, has anybody looked at PET scans or novel imaging in, in uh, and, and maybe Dr. Moscos can comment too. Yeah, so he may be more uh, of an expert on that than me, but I know that people are interested in that, in um, imaging PD-1. I don't know if it's so, possible. So, uh, you know, that falls into the uh, how to decrease the cost and find patients who uh, most likely respond to the therapy. So, um, there are some promising uh, uh, tracers, so it, it's a little bit complicated. So, I, I told you that there is a number of mechanisms of immunosuppression, one of which uh, has to do with the enzyme it's called indolamine deoxygenase. Uh, it is an enzyme that basically metabolizes an amino acid uh, that's called tryptophan. So there are some tracers that we are actually interested at UNC to, to, to use uh, that actually called the C11 AMT, which is an analog of tryptophan, that uh, we hope that patients who have immunosuppression, they would have high levels of uh, the uh, uh, tryptophan analog and we would plan to design a trial where we would image them before treatment and then give the uh, PD-1 and see whether we can correlate activity of the tracer with, um, with, uh, with um, a response to therapy. Uh, but nevertheless, the community yet, I think, and again, that's, that's my, my, my bias, the communities, there are so many of these that we have to, to there's so many options, and right now there has not been a commitment towards one, but it seems that AMT is more likely to move forward, I think. Oh, I have a question back here. So uh, many cancer therapies are partly immune suppressive, and the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, of course, they have off-target effects that could be partially immune suppressive as well. So if you put that in the context of the immunotherapy approaches where you treat with blocking the PD-1 pathway, and you can get responses in about half the patients on, on a good day, like you said. Is there a correlation between the response rate to the initial therapy, the specific tyrosine kinase panels and, and target affiliations with the response to the PD-1? Could you use that as a predictor? Uh, you're asking me? I'm asking anyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, maybe I can, I can take that. Um, so again, with the caveat that I'm not an immunologist, I know that you know different companies are developing PD-1 inhibitors and PD-L1 inhibitors, and they each seem to have their own assay for looking at PD-1 positivity. So you know, in, in the trials, um, PD-1 positivity doesn't perfectly predict response, and then also patients that are PD-1 you know, or PD-L1 negative also seem to respond. So I think. Um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a lot of nuances as whether they're looking at tumor cells or other cells and what they're using is the cutoff. And I was told there was, I believe it was AACR, there's a whole session about this at, at some recent meeting about just how kind of messed up that the whole assays are, for, for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, can you repeat the question? Was that the question <laughs> or not? <laughs> But my question is, you've got two competing influences. You've got the anti-tumor immune response, and that's what you'd like to get. You also have direct anti-tumor effect by a compound or a drug. So if you treat with a compound that is going to target the cancer cell, for many of those treatments, you're also going to be targeting the immune response. So if the immune response is playing an important role in eliminating the tumor cell, you're actually working against yourself often. But that's going to depend very much on the target profile of an individual candidate drug. So I guess my question is, when you list these 10 or so various targeted therapies that are being used in renal cell carcinoma, they're all going to have different kinases that they hit. They're all going to have different effects. So do those effects have a predictive value towards the response to anti-PD-1? So the effects of the kinases? The if you have a patient that doesn't respond to a particular tyrosine kinase inhibitor, is there <laughs> are there kinase inhibitors that uh, don't work? But then that would then predict a response to PD-1 because 
they don't work, and part of, the re part of the reason they don't work is because they didn't block the immune response, and the immune response was playing an important role to control the tumor. So now you get rid of the break, now the immune response is, instead of suppressed, is enhanced. So, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a kidney cancer specialist. So I can tell you that these paradigms of combining uh, kinase inhibitors with immunotherapies have been done in melanoma and are ongoing in melanoma because we know that you may actually want to have uh, benefit from both, uh, from both uh, uh, worlds, so like a direct and that humor effect that would actually may lessen the immunosuppression or whatever is going on, and then coming up sequentially with an immunotherapy. Uh, there has not been any clear signal yet because these trials are ongoing. Nevertheless, the combination of these drugs is very kind of toxic if you give them concurrently. Like there's a lot of hepatotoxicity. I'm aware of a trial where Sutton was given in combination with <coughs> nivolumab. It was very toxic. But I have not heard of whether a response to a tyrosine kinase inhibitor would actually um, correlate with a response to a PD-1. <coughs> Thank you. OK, any last questions? Oh, one more? Sorry, um, as um, my father's uh, um, the candidate for the potential uh, um, active uh, watching, uh, we're always concerned. Do we need to do biopsy to make sure that's cancer or not? Um, as I understand, it, for all the medical therapy, always required pathology uh, level um, diagnosis. But the surgery, maybe not, because anyway you can get the tumor, and then you can do that. Is that true or not? Yeah, so um, one, of, one of the, the common statements by surgeons is that if you're going to take it out, that was your biopsy, right? Um, the fact of the matter is in your father. Even if you were to know what that was, you're very likely not going to want to do anything about it, considering every the whole Weltanschauung, the whole view of things. Um, and uh, biopsying it would just it might give you some more information, but it's not going to affect really what you're going to ultimately do right now. Um, so there is it's not as though biopsy is completely without risk. So why put somebody at risk? if you're not going to act on the information that you're going to obtain. So, so yeah. So uh, in a typical patient like you described, typical, right, never met your dad, typically, we wouldn't encourage, or I wouldn't encourage biopsy simply because it's not really going to change, at least my opinion, but then again, patient gets a shared <laughs> Good. Most, most older patients do. Uh, you know, th those that have one, right? And, and we're talking about an 80 plus year old. If they've won the game of life largely, and that's easy for a 40 year old to say, but maybe when I'm 78, I'm going to be thinking, is it, you know, you, you haven't finished. But um, 94 year olds will commonly say, why are we doing anything? Could I take you? Uh Yeah. And so, so I think. Yeah. So you kind of read my mind. I was going to ask Ed to play devil's advocate. What if gerontuximab scans were approved? Would you do that <laughs> to maybe reassure this gentleman, yeah. or so, would uh, it, you know, maybe add more anxiety if it was positive? You know? Yeah. C two fifty from the land of UCLA. Um, we, uh, you know, in, in this particular incident case, even if I knew, it, so you said it's two and a half centimeters. Uh, no. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So on the basis of size, historical patholo pathologic studies, on the basis of size, there's an 80%, slightly above that, 80% chance that it's kidney cancer. We know that. Knowing it isn't going to really change what you 
might want to do. Um, does that make sense? Where is it? Where is it? If you were, if you were uh, in a in a better total health situation, um, and you were trying to determine whether or not the risk of treatment were worth the intervention, then maybe that would be appropriate. Or I would feel that. Right. I, I think this question kind of sums up the day. Like we have a lot of new therapies, we have a lot of new advances, a lot of new things to do, but ultimately it comes down to every decision seems like it's very personal, right? Um, from the decision to do surgery, to how to manage the drugs, to how to choose which drugs and how, how to do all this is um, ultimately um, uh, very personal. So I, I hope that we've been able to give you a little bit more sense of what's out there and what goes into some of these decisions, you know, what it is we think about and talk about when we're trying to um, help guide you through uh, this whole process. Um, so with that, it is three o'clock. I want to thank our speakers. <laughs> who come and, and, and shared their day with us voluntarily uh, to try to help uh, clarify this, but also to thank you all for coming, for being a very interactive group, and for you know, taking a really active role and interest in uh, 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 this disease, kidney cancer. Um, I would encourage you to um, uh, follow up with the Kidney Cancer Association. The, these, uh, if you want to watch any of these again, they'll all be online, um, I would guess, probably by Monday. Um, the Kidney Cancer Association puts these uh, meetings together um, uh, around the year, about quarterly, and um, let us know if there are topics that you want to hear about. Um, there are way too many topics to cover today. We tried to pick what seemed kind of relevant, new, and, and fresh, and burning. But um, if there are good topics you want to hear, let Mike know, let me know, let the people at the KCA know. And um, next time we do this, we'll um, cover those topics as well. And we're here all the time. And safe travels. <laughs>